Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Plutonium Show. Happy to have you. Well, happy to have you back. Oh yes, I'm back. He That's right. Left me alone. Not he was literally right there. That's the funny part. <laughs> <laughs> left you alone, like, oh gosh. But uh, people missed you in the comments. Oh, thanks, guys. And uh, yeah, now we're back as the duo. Mm -hmm. So we do have a lot to get through today, as you all know. King Charles and Queen Camilla are here with us down under, and uh, unfortunately, we aren't in a situation where we can go meet them or see them or greet them physically because we're not in the area, but that would have been cool. Actually, one of our followers who's been following the Plutonium show for, since the beginning, since 2021, um, went to the church service on Sunday and got to see King Charles. That's pretty cool. She sent me a video. I haven't asked her permission to share it here, but you know, it's, uh, he was right there and yeah, it's pretty cool actually. Just so we're on the same page, today's video is not going to be about, oh, look, this is what they've done, and look at all these photos, and, you know, I'm going to mention the itinerary, but it's, we're not a news channel. Yeah, I think we'll let the news channels do the, they went here and they went there. Yeah. Not, our, not our vibe. So what we're going to do is briefly touch upon what they're here for, for how long, but then we're going to talk about deeper things. I hope so, at least, <laughs> because the media is really getting on my nerves with this trip, actually. I don't remember the last time the media wasn't on my nerves, to be honest. Yeah, that's true. So I'm not surprised. So they arrived on Friday night, a rainy Friday night. And on the night of their arrival, you can see here images, beautiful images of the Sydney Opera House, where they've put in projections of King Charles and Queen Camilla, Already people were trying to make it a problem and say, oh, they snubbed Diana by not putting her up there. What? She's not, I mean, she's not here with us anymore. I, yeah, it kind of makes sense that you're putting up photos of people who are coming to visit us. I don't see how that's a snub. It's like, are we snubbing William and Catherine because we didn't put them up? I don't understand the, the logic. I think people are trying to say, well, he visited with her in 1983. And okay, but it's... You know, it's not exactly like they parted on good terms and and she's passed. Yeah. You know, she's passed on. So uh, quite honestly, and I'm saying this with, with all due respect to her and her memory, this trip has nothing to do with Princess Diana. I would have thought that if we were going to dedicate anything to Diana, it would be on the anniversary of her death. And that's when we would light up the opera house and have her there. If we truly care about it and we're not just, you know, being outraged of something just because. Yeah, I mean, isn't that typical modern internet world? Just get outraged and offended over anything? It's like, hmm, that seems like a perfectly peaceful thing. I am going to find something wrong with it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, but otherwise, very beautiful imagery. They had Saturday off. Now, of course, that's not normal, but given number one, of course, most importantly, King Charles's cancer diagnosis, mm -hmm. he has paused treatment for the duration of his trip to this area of the world. He has two doctors with him. Good. And I also read he has a supply of his own blood with him if need be. Oh, that's excellent. So um, we have to remember he's not well. We also have to remember even if they were well, they're well into their 70s. And that's not to say that people who are of a certain age can't be energetic or, you know, get straight into work. But honestly, I wouldn't know. Mm. He's like 50 years older than us. So I, I wouldn't know. But I'm just trying to be respectful to people in the audience. I'm not saying you're like an invalid or something. But mm. I think anyone who's been on a long haul trip, regardless of age, and this is where we can testify being young people, when you get on a flight and you go to anywhere in the world from Australia, and we've been to Europe from Australia, so that's the journey that he's taken. You know, I know you're not in Europe anymore, but that area of the world, it's punishing on anyone. Yeah. It's ridiculous that many time zones. And I mean, we've done trips where the first day is like, all right, let's beat this jet lag. So I can only imagine how hard it is doing it, especially if he doesn't do that regularly. I yeah. mean, when was the last time he was in Australia? Uh, 2018, I believe. Yeah. So in man. the Gold Coast. Oh. Huh. So yes, they had a bit of a rest. But then on Sunday, they got straight into it, starting off in Sydney and they're going to Canberra as well. And these are the only two places 
that they will be visiting during their very short stay here, by the way. I believe it's from the 18th to the 23rd, so five days. But that's because the point of his trip to this part of the world is really to attend the Commonwealth Heads of State Government meeting in Samoa between October 21 and 26th. And look, I'm going to go double check my dates. I think they're here till the 22nd, actually, Tuesday, October 22nd. And look at Marie Claire, by the way, when I typed it in here to uh, double check. This Marie Claire, and I'm pointing it out because they are a Meghan and Harry mouthpiece. Yeah. This is the only reason I'm bringing this up. Get a load of this. King Charles and Camilla will visit Australia between Friday 18th and Saturday 22nd of October. Hmm. I didn't know Friday and Saturday had so many days between them. This is news to me. <laughs> Maybe they think time works differently down under. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, it's upside down. Does Australia even exist? Like, oh, jeez. Yeah, Marie Claire. I mean, now you know why they are Meghan and Harry's lap dogs, pretty much. They can't even get their bloody basic you know, humanness, like just being a basic human, a child knows. <laughs> what are the days of the week? Oh, yep. that's hilarious. So yeah, they're leaving on Saturday the 22nd, guys. <laughs> Don't let anyone tell you it's Tuesday. <laughs> that sounds like the sort of lies that a mouthpiece from Meghan and Harry would try and push. Uh, Seriously, they're so silly. Gosh. So in terms of itinerary, if we have members in our audience who are in Australia, believe it or not, we have a very small percentage of audience members who actually live in Australia, even though that's where we broadcast out of. I don't understand. Maybe it's just a reflection of the level of interest mm. that Australians have in the monarchy, but it's a tiny, tiny percentage of people. Um, but if you're interested, you've got Tuesday at 4.20 p.m. If you live in Sydney, the King and Queen will be at the Sydney Opera House and you get access from 3 p.m. So that's when the area opens up. And then at 4.50, members of the public should be in place by 4 p.m. before the King and Queen join a boat at Sydney's Man of War steps ahead of a Navy fleet review. Mm. And that seems to be the end of their itinerary in Australia. So yeah, short and sweet. It's not King Charles's first visit to Australia. I think anyone who knows about um, the royal family would know that there have been multiple visits by the royal family, including, of course, the late Queen Elizabeth II, to this very, very faraway land. And I've picked out a couple of notable visits um, from the then Prince Charles. Did you know that in 1966, he spent six months, so two terms as a 17-year-old, going to school here? Wow. Yep. Wow, that's something. Which school did he go to? He went, I have it here. Geelong Grammar School. Hmm. I'm mm. yeah. Never sorry, heard of it. Sorry if I'm pronouncing. You you all know I'm not you know Australian by birth. You can tell from my accent. So <laughs> I'm Australian by birth, and I don't know how to pronounce it either. So isn't it Geelong? I think it's Geelong, but you know someone will know how. You have to be in an area to know how to pronounce things. Yeah, <laughs> like before we came to Australia, and we would see on the map Wollongong. Yeah, and, and we just, just didn't know. It. <laughs> We yeah. didn't know. And for me, it's second nature, Wollongong. Like, that's just how it is. <laughs> so, yeah, he's been here a number of times. And there, there was this other notable time, which I only recently found out about. In 1979, when he was 30, and he was randomly and unexpectedly kissed by a so-called model hmm. at Cottleslow... Wait, Cottesloe. At Cottesloe Beach if I'm pronouncing that wrong, my apologies, in Perth. Right. So the reason I, you know, put the randomly and unexpectedly in quotation marks is because it wasn't as random as people would have liked you to believe. Mm, yeah, sounds like a spin on the media, doesn't it? No, it wasn't actually the media this time. It was the prince's own office. Oh, interesting. Yep, right. they set it up to reportedly to overhaul his public persona. And we know this because the woman in question called Jane Priest, I believe, who was 26 at the time, yes, Jane Priest, was handpicked and also met the, the then Prince Charles the night before where she was chosen for the job. And it was basically a setup for her to go and kiss him and yeah, just make him look like the desirable young 
bachelor prince. Right. Yeah. I, I'm glad you explained it because I I don't quite understand how that repairs someone's image or helps their image. Is like random person randomly kissing you. It's just, huh? I don't know. Would would they even? They wouldn't do that today. That's such an old timey thing. It really is, especially in this climate. I. Yeah. The thing is, I'm glad it's staged because. I don't, if you reverse the genders and some random guy went up to a girl and kissed her on the beach, that would be basically, yeah, that would be, it's over. the police would be involved. Yeah. So I'm glad it was staged because if you've been on this channel long enough, I really believe that we should, you know, men and women should be in terms of being touched and, and kissed and they need to be both afforded respect and a barrier. You yep. know, just because you're a woman doesn't mean you can just run up and randomly kiss a guy. Yeah, we're not free game just because, you know, you happen to be the opposite gender. And if you all don't know why we're a bit touchy about this topic, long-term subscribers would know that Harry, Harry, wow, Harry, not Harry, Zach. What? <laughs> what? I thought you were going to tell me something about Harry then. I was like, <laughs> wait, I'm a long-term subscriber. <laughs> what did I miss? Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> Zach. Uh, and we're laughing. Look, it's, it's, it's the names that that's funny, the, the, the mistake with the name, but the topic isn't funny. Zach was um, sexually assaulted by a woman multiple times, more than once. So it's, it's, it's pretty touchy, you know, pun unintended, by mm. the way. So yeah. uh, let's move on. Now, we know King Charles visited 16 times prior, but while this may not be his first visit, it is his first visit as king. I was curious about that myself because... I was pretty sure that was the case, just based on my own memory. Not that I kept a quote. Oh, yeah. yes, King Charles is coming. Like, yeah. What? And not only is it his first visit as king, hmm. he's the first king to ever visit. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. Wow. So none of the previous kings. I mean, when was the last time it was a king? It was before Queen Elizabeth? It was, it was her father. Her father, yeah. And he never made it because, unfortunately, he passed away before he had a chance. He made it before he was king. Yeah. When he was a duke. Right. But by the time he became king, mm. he was unwell and he couldn't, um, he couldn't make the trip. So, yes, first king. And another tidbit. Did you all know that out of two assassination attempts in Australia made against royalty, one of them was aimed at Prince Charles himself? Mm. You know this because I showed you the video. Yeah, no, I'm I'm actually I haven't even heard about the other. I learn more about history on this podcast with you or being involved in your solo videos behind the scenes than I do in history class at school, right? So much more. And it's stuff I'm genuinely interested in. Like we had two assassination attempts. Yeah. I didn't know we had two. Well, the first one was um, against Queen Victoria's son, Prince Alfred. Right. In his 1867 tour. Mm -hmm. And that was apparently a disastrous tour. One of his crew members drowned wow. during the first stop in South Australia. Several more people died in a major fire accident. Oh my goodness. And a Catholic Protestant skirmish took place in Melbourne. But most... Memorably, there was an assassination attempt against Prince Alfred in Sydney as well. Huh. Wow. So with King Charles, though, this happened in 1994 when a student protester, David Kang, fired blanks. Now we know they're blanks hmm. from a starter pistol in protest of Australia's treatment of Cambodian refugees. It happened as Prince Charles was being introduced to the crowd at Darling Harbour. There were two shots. And he was on stage. I think he was fixing, you can look at the screen, I'll be playing the footage, you know, fixing his cufflings or something. And he just looks so unbothered by it all. Yeah. And I'm laughing because of his bravery. It's, it's almost unbelievable to witness how brave and how really unbothered. It almost looked like he was inconvenienced by it. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? You're interrupting my... You know, are we like, having technical issues? Did someone drop a microphone? He, but his instincts just... They weren't there, you yeah. know? So his, uh, his protection guard had to jump him, basically. Mm. You know, protect him and throw their bodies over him. And fun fact, the protester went on to become a barrister. Wow. 
Yep. That's not the first time. <laughs> well, that is the first time I've ever heard of, oh, someone who had an assassination. Is it really an assassination attempt if there were blanks? Blanks. Though? Yeah. Look, I don't want to get into too much of the history. We talked about this in my treason videos in part two. Um, there were similar assassination attempts against Queen Victoria, mm -hmm. where they were also basically blanks. And yeah. um, there was never a serious real attempt to harm her. And so they weren't charged with high treason. They were charged with a lesser offense, okay. which didn't carry the death penalty, thanks to Prince Albert, her husband, mm. because he thought it wasn't fair to charge them with high treason. Yeah. I mean, that's just it, right? You, it, When you rock up with ammunition that's intended to end someone's life and you rock up with blanks, those are two very different scenarios. Absolutely. The intention. Exactly. Yes. And I mean, it's the difference between murder and manslaughter. Yeah, yeah, it's, so, it's a huge difference. So, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that he did that. Uh, I'm just trying to remember when we actually had gun laws introduced in Australia. I feel like we had our gun laws introduced in the 90s. I have no idea. I, I remember hearing about it um, a little a few years ago and understanding that. Uh, but, yeah, it's interesting because it's not like... We don't normally get that sort of thing. It's not like uh, like they have in America yeah, right now. Yeah. Well, we, they have assassination attempts. It's like, well, there's free access to weapons. So I'm trying yeah. to figure out which side of the coin that fell on, whether it was before or after, and that person could have freely accessed firearms. Well, it's beyond the purview of this episode, but I can mm. tell you as a military gal that it is very strict to the point where as a person qualified to carry you know, military-grade weapons, mm -hmm. I can't... I don't have a civilian license. Yeah. I don't have a firearms license out of a military situation. If you are interested in a video on the purpose of royal tours throughout the centuries, I made one back in May called The Pretender. And it was in the context of showing how Meghan's and Harry's fake tours, specifically in Nigeria this year, are, you know, what, what's, what's the point? What's the point of it all? And so I contrast that with the point of actual real royal tours. So if you're interested and you haven't seen it or you want a refresher, you can go ahead and watch that after this podcast is over. We'll see you at the end. <laughs> now, when I was looking up articles and keeping up with the news of this visit for the purposes of this podcast, I noticed something which eventually started to get on my nerves when I started to compare and contrast with reality. Mm. Because what I found is on the internet, the headlines will have you believe that King Charles's visit is reigniting Republican sentiments and people are not as fond of King Charles as they are of Queen Elizabeth and the era, you know, the reign of Charles as head of state of Australia is coming to an end. And I was like, what do you mean? That's not what I'm seeing out in reality and on the news and people seem quite happy with him. And if anything, his favorability ratings, I've got polls we're going to get to, have gone up. Hmm. So what I figured was that the media was being the media. They were trying to make this out to be something that it is not. Now, I'm not saying there aren't certain interested parties in Australia that have Republican sentiments and are talking about it. And I'm not saying that there aren't opposing parties. So we have in Australia the Australian Republican Movement and we have the Australian Monarchist League. Right. And those two political factions basically are warring it up you know right now because they're taking it as an opportunity mm -hmm. to push their own agenda yeah naturally because it sounds like exactly what they would do they're almost designed to take advantage of anything that the royals do because it's oh no we should do this no we should do that on to you know king charles can blow his nose and they'll be like this is why we should be a republic <laughs> this is why we should be a monarchy yeah so it's really not a reflection if anyone out there is wondering what the environment is in Australia regarding, you know, royalty, to be honest, for the most part, people, and I say this in a respectful way, not in a derogatory way, people really don't care. Mm. That's the most common sentiment you'll find. You, you're, you've grown up here, yep. you were born here, mm -hmm. and did you even ever, like, did the royal family ever, was, sorry, so was the royal family ever a part of life and conversation in Australia? As far as I'm concerned, only in school. We were taught why the Union Jack is on our flag. Mm -hmm. uh, we were taught that we are under Queen Elizabeth. But as soon as you leave school, it's almost irrelevant. Our political parties don't even reference that we're a part of a monarchy. It never comes up in anything I've heard. And as much as I do try to stay out of politics, I've been accused of living under a rock. I do not 
think it is important to the everyday Australian whether we are a monarchy or a republic because it whether it comes down to our quality of life is when Australians will start caring. How does that affect them going to work or their home or their school or any of that? If it doesn't affect any of that, I don't think people really care. You know, I think what you just said is a very accurate reflection of what one of these articles has actually mentioned. Now, one of these articles is from the Washington Post, so obviously not even Australian. And get a load of of this headline. For Charles's first visit as king, Australians are royally unimpressed. Now, first of all, on what ba- what what are you basing that on? I really want to know, and I wanted to find out. So obviously, I read the body, and I was surprised to find out that the body of the article is closer to the truth than that sensationalist headline. So it's clickbait. It's absolutely quick clickbait. And I don't know much about the Washington Post, but I would have assumed it's not a tabloid and it was more of a respectable publication. Wasn't the Washington Post the one that published actually Amber Heard's op-ed that Johnny sued her for? <laughs> I think it was. Uh, that, so uh, I, take yeah. I take that back. I take that back. Now, that's not to say that, as I said, some politicians are not making this political, for instance, and their article references this, all six state premiers in Australia have declined an invitation to meet the king at his welcome reception in Canberra. Hmm. I don't know why. Some of them say they have, you know, pre-existing engagements that they had to attend. I think, without knowing further information, if it is political, I mean, look, to each their own, I suppose, but I feel like you'd have a responsibility as a member of government to attend these things and not insult the king who's sick and came all the way out here? I I don't know. I I entirely agree with you because when it comes to politics, what you don't do is just as important as what you do because not attending sends a message. Everyone's going to read into that. Even if you had prior engagements, the fact that all six, that's a bit, mm, bit odd. And look, I'm not going to uh, i'll give them the benefit of the doubt sure you're busy but you can make time for things yeah you you make time for things that are important that's not true of just politicians that's true of everyone in life yeah so the article with that sensationalist headline from the washington post talks about how there's less enthusiasm and look i don't know if that's true but i think realistically even if there was less enthusiasm i would point it to more of people are more into the younger royals Okay. They're more into William and Catherine. Yeah. They were really into William. Uh, what's his face? Harry and Meghan. <laughs> what's his face? And um, <laughs> just look at my face. It made you say Harry that time. So I don't know why you look nothing like him. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't insult you like that. No, I'm so thank sorry. You. <laughs> but basically, I think people are more interested in the younger royals. It is a reality. It, I know that people say all the time that you know they can't wait till William and Catherine's children grow up because they're going to completely overshadow Meghan and Harry. So. It is a reality, so perhaps that plays into it. But at the same time, the article goes on to actually say, number one, it's both the avid monarchists and zealous Republicans who are making this uh, a big deal when it's not. Even though, I'm reading straight from the article now, most Australians more worried about the cost of living or the US presidential election may simply shrug. Yeah. It's exactly what you said. Yeah, literally U.S. politics has more to do with our country because that will directly affect our economy than whether or not King Charles has a presence in this country. Well, I think what you say about as long as people are not affected negatively, that is spot on. And that's what made me reference this article and bring it up because it says there is almost a complacency. It's like, yeah, we're a monarchy, but it seems okay. We haven't had any coups. We're a pretty stable democracy. Mm. So that's exactly it. That's how people see it. There's no harm, you know? And a lot of Australians, especially the ones you can see, hopefully I have footage um, in this episode, turning up in droves, whether it's King Charles, whether it's Prince William, whether it's Prince Harry, there are clearly tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, of Australians who love the monarchy yeah. and are avid supporters of it. And I'm sure a lot of you, if not all of you, are audience members of this channel. I don't believe we would have any Australian Republicans in this audience. Mm. Uh, full disclosure, personally, I'm not a monarchist. I just 
feel that what Meghan and Harry have done to the individual human beings that happen to be royalty is wrong. Yeah. I actually don't believe in, you know, appointed by God and anointed or, you know, all that. I don't think anyone is, a, you know, a royal highness. I just respect these people as human beings who have been wronged on a global stage, mm -hmm. even though from what we all know, they don't deserve it. Absolutely. I think it's uh, also a reflection of something that a lot of people feel in their own families, if they've been betrayed by their own families, to see what Meghan and Harry have done to their own and go, hmm, I'm in a similar situation, but I'm not alone in this. Yeah. So basically, the media is drumming up this drama when it doesn't really exist on the ground. Yep. And as people on the ground, literally this time, we have the privilege of finally being, you know, uh, the destination, right? Because yep. we're always so far away and reporting on the news from halfway across the globe. But we can tell you that is an accurate reflection of, you know, nothing. There are no anti-monarchist sentiments all over Australia. I will say there are minority protesters that have showed up, for example, yesterday at the church where the king and Queen Camilla were. Mm -hmm. But those are to be expected. Some of them are supporters of the First Nations resistance to colonization, for instance, you're going to expect that. You know, there were protesters during his coronation as well. Absolutely. And I will also reflect on a personal experience I've had here during one of the two times I have done work for a prime minister in Australia. There were protesters at both of those. Even a small little press conference yep. was one of those. And sure enough, even though the press conference was just mostly media and then the pres uh, the prime minister and his um, immediates, there were two or three people there at this small little venue. Yeah, protesting. Uh, just protesting, yeah. you know. So I think any time anyone of any political significance rocks up, you will always have protesters. If you want an accurate insight into what the public actually feels, aside from the footage, aside from what we're telling you from, you know, um, eyewitness evidence, I suppose... Have a look at the polls. Before I pull them up, just as a refresher for anyone, I didn't know this because it was I was a baby when this, this was happening and I certainly wasn't in Australia. In 1999, there was a referendum in Australia asking people to vote, you know, pro against Republic. And 54.9%, so basically 55%, voted against a Republic. Right. Okay, so that's our history. That's the background. Now, more recently... We have a public poll, if I can find it in my... There it is. We have a few popularity polls, which aren't really the point of this topic, but I'll show you anyway. Has your view of King Charles changed since he became king? And this is in Australia. These are all Australian polls. Um, a lot of people say they like him more now, which is the opposite of the Washington Post's headline or what, what it's implying, at least. So this is... The truth, these are facts, these are numbers, these are not sensationalist headlines put up by publications with an agenda. Clickbait, man. I can't, it just still blows my mind that these media publications will insult other platforms that aren't traditional media, but then go ahead and copy exactly what they're doing. Yeah, with the clickbait. And even more realistically, you can see my view of him has not changed. People are, a lot of people are indifferent in Australia. That is the truth. And then Queen Camilla as well. Most 21% like her more. And 69% say, meh, hasn't really changed. 40% of people prefer if Prince William and Princess Catherine were touring instead of the king and queen. 36% no, so that's pretty close. And 24% don't know. And this may be a reflection of what I said. The younger royals are just more of an attraction. Yeah, It's just life. It's just the way things work. But more relevant to today's topic do you believe australia should become a republic 45 percent said no 33 percent said yes and 21 are unsure yeah i am actually very happy that they included a lot of unsure in here that they gave people the option to pick that in this poll because if i was filling out this poll i don't strongly believe that we should be a republic or not I don't have enough information. So you'd be unsure. I would be unsure. And if I was faced with just a yes or no, I would probably be like, oh, can I skip this question? Because I don't want to be biased in the poll. I just don't want to pick something for the hell of it. So it's good that we can see people who haven't made up their mind. For me personally, look, 
I wasn't born and raised here. I'm a naturalized citizen. So I don't, I'm also like you. I don't have a strong opinion either way. I'm just going to go on shore as well, probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, there is a question in the bottom. Do you believe Australia will ever become a republic? And 44% say yes. Hmm. 22% say no. And 34 are unsure. And I think I would fall again in the unsure. Yeah, I think when you show people, and this is this is what it comes down to, even in our in normal everyday politics, when you show people what will change in their everyday life, that's when they'll make up their mind. Is this going to benefit us or is this going to hinder us? Yeah. And until you can do that, then I don't know. It doesn't. It's not really important. And get a load of this. King Charles and next in line Prince William are both more popular than all Australian politicians. I 100% believe that. I believe it too. 100%. And I'm not going to get into Australian politics as much as I will stay away from anyone else's politics, but I believe that. King Charles is actually more popular than current Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. Yep. <laughs> oh, and also just in case you were wondering, actually Queen Camilla's not doing too well in this poll, but Megan. Megan is also not doing well. Megan's pretty much at the bottom of the pile. Mm -hmm. Close to Prince Andrew is at the bottom of the pile, by the way. I think if it wasn't for the Prince the Prince Andrew scandal, Megan, Megan would be, would be a, yeah. pretty close to the bottom. So yeah, I think the polls tell us a story, which is number one, don't believe the media. I don't think we need to tell you this, but really don't believe the media. They all have their agenda. Yep. And this is actually a perfect uh, time for me to bring up uh, our partner, actually, for this podcast called Ground News. It's a news aggregator, and it promotes transparency by showing you, the reader, the political biases of all the publications. So where they lean, whether they're more right, center, left. So they share the news with you without trying to influence the narrative. Yeah. Which is exactly why the mainstream media exists today, to influence the narrative, to control mm -hmm. it. So if you are interested in getting access to reliable news, transparency, and to make up your own mind about things, then you can visit the link that I have up on screen, but also in the description box. I might even pin it in a comment, which is check.ground.news slash lost beyond Pluto. That's check.ground.news slash lost beyond Pluto, it will give you 15% off a Vantage plan, which is a plan that I have. And it gives you full access to both the website version of Ground News and the mobile app. So give it a go if you'd like to not only support this channel, but also an independent news aggregator that doesn't have an agenda. Yeah, because we don't like agendas here, do we? Well, everyone has an agenda. I shouldn't say that, but it doesn't have the agenda, a malicious agenda of controlling your thoughts. Mm. Their agenda is transparency. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. We all have an agenda. I remember when I made that video, the agenda. Yeah. What's your agenda? All the comments were basically, someone please tell me. It was a video about Candace Owens and Oprah and how they have this sinister agenda. And I'm not going to go into it. If you haven't watched it, go watch it. But basically in the comments, people were like, someone please tell me what this girl's agenda is. It's like, my agenda, well, I joked and said, my agenda is getting clout off of Candace Owen's name because that's what you told me. You figured it out. To end today's episode, because we're already really going over time. Hee <laughs> hee. I hate that because I'm the one editing and I, I keep kicking myself when I'm editing. Why did you go over the half hour mark? I'm trying to think of future Pluto. Please let us know if you prefer the longer <laughs> episodes because that way Pluto will actually feel better if she's spent a long time editing a longer episode. It takes hours. I don't know why. It's not even an hour on footage and it takes hours. Um, but joke of the week. Harry says he's open to forgive the royal family. Get the hell out of here, boy. What? Wait, we've had a bit of an evolution. It used to be demanding apology i will forgive if you if you apologize to my wife for uh treating her like a princess a duchess but now it's evolved to hey hey i'm i'm, I'm ready you know the money's running now the clout's running out like real bad this time because it's been running out for four years who are we kidding uh but yeah apparently he's ready but then prince william and king charles according to this royal expert are not gee i wonder why <laughs> My goodness, it's, oh, it blows my mind how he knows. He has to know. He knows how ridiculous it sounds, but he's trying to switch the narrative. Hey, they need to forgive me so that anyone reading that article will be like, 
They need to forgive him. What they do against him? It's like, stop muddying the waters. We can see right through you. Oh my goodness. I think he's trying to say, please take me back. I I've, think I've, I've, I've failed. I've effed up. And how magnanimous, just how magnanimous that you committed all the wrongdoings. How, how upstanding of you to offer them a forgiveness after doing everything you've done to them. It's just, yeah, I have, I have no words. That's why I called it joke of the week. It's like what I was saying earlier in the podcast, how this is a direct reflection of what some people go through with their own families. The person who wrongs them and does all the horrible things to them and then waits for the forgiveness from the victim. It's crazy. It's actual just gaslighting 101. It's disgusting. You know, if it, if it wasn't so old and rehashed, it would be more infuriating than funny. But at this point, all you can do is laugh. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what really, really blows my mind is that he's already said this before. They've both said it. Yep. They've said similar words, words to this degree. And then the obviously the backlash from everyone going, why are you asking them to... It's well, why back- are you demanding an apology or why are you forgiving them? What have you do- What have they done for you to forgive them? Exactly. And then you ignore all the criticism and the fact that no one's falling for your BS and you go and say it again. It is, it is choosing to be ignorant. We literally had a podcast a couple of weeks ago called The Broken Record of Montecito. Monty, yep. Monty shit show, actually. <laughs> but because uh, that's what they are. They are a broken record. They don't even know what's going on anymore. They don't know what's top and bottom. They just, or heads or tails. And they, yeah, they just, they don't know. Yep. Um, what I do know is I'm going to end it here. So let us know what you think of today's topics. It's a bit different because we focused on King Charles and his visit and the whole Republican scandal. So... Don't know if it's going to have a lot of interest. Unfortunately, some people say, stop talking about the duo. And then really, people are only interested in listening to topics about them. So it's very confusing for us content creators. Very mixed messages. Yeah. I'm not the kind of content creator who sits there and asks people, well, what do you want me to talk about? I'm I'm really not because I know that's not good for long term for my channel. If I just do what people want, I have to do what I find interesting as well. So, um... All this to say, this was interesting to us. Hope it was interesting to you. Our tiny percentage of Australian audience members let us know about, you know, what you think about the whole Republican versus monarchist thing that the media is trying to drum up. Let us know if you've gone to see the king as well. And if you have, you can send us photos and videos over at Instagram at Lost Beyond Pluto. I'll be very happy to receive those. And uh, yeah. Hope you otherwise have a good week. And we will see you in the next podcast. Bye-bye. See ya.